And let me jump right in. I'll start with a story. One of our clients is a California company called Paramount Farms, and they happen to be the world's largest grower of pistachios. They own 64,000 acres of orchards in the San Joaquin Valley, and they have a processing plant in uh, just north of Bakersfield. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned Bakersfield. It's in a town called Lost Hills, where they process millions of pounds of pistachios every year. We took them to India several years ago, and today their products are sold in over 12,000 outlets all over the country in India. Uh, they're replacing primarily Iranian product. Iran is the other country that, that produces pistachios besides the United States, and the third country is Afghanistan, which has a very limited production. So on the top left, you see one of their billboards called Lip Smacking, and it's very similar to the campaigns they use in the U.S., on the bottom right, you see the picture of their first roasting plant in India, in the city of Baroda, in, uh, in Gujarat, in western India. Uh, Paramount Farms ships products all over the world from Lost Hills. And the first time they opened a location outside of the United States was in India, even though they sell much more into Europe and into China and other places. And this was a recognition how India needs to function a little differently for them. I'm going to run through a quick introduction, and then I'll talk about how the, the four P's of marketing uh, apply differently in India. If we have time, we'll talk about a few challenges and then get into takeaways. I will take a stop in the middle just to uh, simulate any questions that people might have so that uh, it gives you a chance to address your concerns before I go forward. Why should you be concerned about India today? I've listed some of the reasons here. Just a few months ago, uh, the former uh, Commerce Secretary John Bryson, who's right from here in Southern California, actually led an India trade mission, uh, which was very successful. Earlier than that, uh, President Obama uh, was in India uh, in November 2010. I was one of the very few Californians who accompanied the president on the executive mission to India. There were about uh, 100 and something business people who went with him and about three of us from California were part of the mission. And the reason he went there was uh, you know, partly political and strategic, but really partly to help open up the market for American goods and services. When we look at consumer goods in particular, India is going to become the, among the top five consumer markets in the world because it's growing very fast. The overall GDP is growing at 6 to 9% depending on the year, but consumer goods are growing at 13 to 18, 20, 22 percent, depending on the year. And the recent phenomenon is that companies from the U.S. are beginning to win in this market. I will give you some examples of that as we go along. I believe that 2012 is a critical year for many of you on the phone today because the long-term implications that will happen as a result of the decisions you make in the next 6 to 12 months, uh, getting yourself either behind the competition or ahead of the competition. Here's a graph from Morgan Stanley. This is a few years ago, but I think it shows a point that is well worth making. And this really plots the adjusted per capita GDP on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, it's the number of years since economic progress began. So Japan's progress really began after the Second World War. And this, this graph is about five years old. So you see that Japan is all the way up at the top because its standards are very similar today to the West. Whereas at the bottom you see, towards the bottom you see China, and then even earlier than that you see India. And you see this S-curve, uh, and this, this is very typical of economies that are liberalizing. The reason this is important is that once you enter India, you are assured that the growth in personal income or personal GDP in India is going to be very significant. As a result, the wind is in your back when you go to India, and you can be assured of the kind of growth companies saw when they entered markets such as Singapore and Taiwan years ago, or Korea more recently, or China even more recently. India has been about 10 years behind China because it started its liberalization 13 years after China did. In 1991 is when India started its liberalization. And like I said, this graph is about five years old, so you can shift the point of India to you know, a little past where the Philippines is on this graph. The other reason that I think is very important and that many Americans miss 
when they look at markets worldwide is very well exemplified both in the graph on the right side and the pictures on the left side. People in India love the United States. In fact, when Ipsos ran this survey a few years ago, they found that Indians favor the United States more than virtually any other country in the world and right next to Americans' own view of the United States. So if you look uh, at the graph, you will see countries like, you know, when people talk about the BRIC countries, Russia is all the way down at 23% of Russians liking, uh, liking uh, America. You look at China, and it's down at 34% of Chinese citizens having a favorable view to the U.S. But you look at India, and the number is like 72%. Okay. I, I have these pictures on the left are pictures I took when I traveled to India. And on the top, you see an ad from a cell phone company. And the reason I wanted to point this ad out to you is that you, you of course, will recognize the Statue of Liberty and the Golden Gate Bridge uh, and, 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 and a typical American school bus inside the, inside the, 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 the snow globe. But the point is that the average Indian citizen who has never seen any of those images, Indian school buses don't look yellow and black like this one. They recognize the Statue of Liberty and the Golden Gate Bridge and the Hollywood sign as symbols of America. So the American brand is very visible to the average Indian, whether or not they speak English. You'll see this ad is actually in Tamil, in a southern Indian language, which you see on the right of the photo. At Amrit, we are known as the India experts, and we work with small and large companies to help them get into the Indian market. Uh, we have a focus area on consumer packaged goods, which is, why, which is what I'm talking about today. The picture on the upper right, by the way, is the Levi's store in Bangalore. It's one of the busiest retail stores in the country. And if you do ever visit Bangalore, I, I, I do suggest that you stop by there and take a look at how differently Levi's sells its products in India. People are impressed with the consumer market in India for some of the reasons listed here. India's population is over a billion people. However, the population that you will want to focus on is not the entire billion. Most likely, your products will appeal to the middle class, which is significantly smaller than that number uh, you see. However, it is large enough that it makes for a substantial market. People define the Indian middle class differently. And the Indian definition says the middle class is 300 million people. I don't necessarily buy that from the American point of view. Uh, if you imagine the lifestyle that the typical American middle class person lives, I would say that the number is closer to about 100 million. But that's 100 million customers that have not yet bought your products or services in any volume. And these people have the income and the capacity and the, the inclination to buy American today. So it's a very, very substantial market by any measure. India is a complex country with 23 official languages and hundreds of dialects. But the business of India is run in English. And so it is easy for a Western visitor uh, traveling there for the first time or uh, you know, for the first few times to be able to function there compared to, say, a country like China. I've listed some of the major cities at the bottom of this slide. I won't dwell on those. I'll be happy to send a copy of this uh, presentation out to anybody who emails me. And, and, and my email address will be available at the end of this uh, presentation. There are many consumer product companies active in India. Some are listed here, uh, some of the biggest ones. And you will see that the top three companies really have European roots. The giant is really Unilever. And they are much, much more powerful in India than Procter & Gamble is. Uh, you see that, that they, they are almost bigger than everybody else on this slide put together. You've got Nestle, which is Swiss, and ITC, which used to be the Imperial Tobacco Company. They, 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 in addition to cigarettes, they sell consumer goods, and that's about a billion dollars worth. You may not recognize the next three or four names because they are domestic Indian companies, and they are getting stronger and stronger by, by, by the year. And then you see Colgate Palmolive listed at about 400 million. There are other companies making this list. Amway is about the same size in sales, and L'Oreal and others are, 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 are rapidly rising on this list. But the, the, the good news is that the upside for American companies is huge. Here's one example of an American company that entered India some time ago, and they are very active in medical devices, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, 
But in the consumer business in India today, uh, really they're uh, at the baby level. They are the only brand that middle class mothers would consider. Very few companies uh, would even dare to compete with Johnson & Johnson in the baby powder uh, and, uh, and other infant products where, where J&J offers something. They do sell Band-Aid in India, and uh, their, uh, their, uh, uh, their brand for uh, women's uh, feminine hygiene products is also right up there uh, at, at almost 50% market share. Uh, J&J has had a very, very good success story in India. Uh, they continue to expand in other areas where they are uh, in India where they are not so strong, uh, but it's an indication of how a company can, can become very successful. Now, why is India moving so rapidly? There's really four factors that I think apply for the consumer market. One is the fact that because of the growth in the economy, the income per capita is rising very rapidly and will continue to do so given the demographics of India for the next 15 to 20 years for sure. The second factor is that India used to be a rural economy. Even today, more than 60% 60, 60 of India's population lives in the villages. However, there's a tremendous move towards the cities. The large cities, the second tier cities, even the third tier cities are growing at very rapid rates and a couple of hundred million people will move from the villages to the cities in the next five years. This enables them to be able to participate in the more modern economy readily. Selling into the villages is possible for a Western company, but it's a little big, bigger challenge because of the supply chain and the, uh, uh, the difficulty of getting product to the retail location. In the cities, it is far easier to do so. India is one of the youngest countries in the world as far as median age, younger than China and younger certainly than any European or North American uh, 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 country. The average age, uh, the median age is under 25 years, and uh, almost 60 to 75 percent of the country is under 35 years of age. Many of these people have not yet formed their brand preferences. Another important factor to remember is that media consumption is increasing rapidly. As literacy is increasing, you find that all forms of media in, are in, in India are growing, whether it's television, radio, internet, even print media. Newspapers thrive in India. The largest circulating newspaper in the world now is a newspaper published in the Hindi language called the Dainik Jagran. And actually, the owners of the Dainik Jagran newspaper live about a quarter mile from where I grew up in the city of Kanpur in India. And it's one of the few markets, India is one of the few markets where, where newsprint is growing today. Uh, I have another case story with uh, Colgate Palmolive, uh, which has been in India for a little while, but just last year they introduced a new product uh, very specifically targeted at sensitive people with sensitive teeth. Uh, they developed this uh, particular flavor of the product just for the Indian market, and very rapidly they were able to establish a 15% market share, uh, despite the fact that there were other companies selling uh, sensitive, uh, sensitive uh, 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 toothpaste for sensitive teeth in the Indian market. And this is just to show how the Indian market is very responsive to superior products and good advertising and marketing. Let me take a short break here at this time, Liz, and see if people have questions that they would like answered. Okay, so great. Thank you so much. Bye. Do we have any questions coming through? I, 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 can you repeat that, sir? Liz, I'm having trouble hearing the the, the, the audience. Uh, are you able to hear them? 
Well, if not, we can continue the process here and wait, wait till the end for the questions. Okay, we'll do that then. Um, so I'm going to go through the so-called four P's of marketing, a product, price, promotion, and place. Uh, those of you who went to business school or took a marketing class will recognize these. But I will tell you what happens to these factors as you approach the Indian market. So uh, a couple of years ago, a client came to us because they were selling their products into India. But they found that their actual volume of sales was significantly lower than what they had predicted at the end of year two. Year one, they wrote it off to, well, we're just getting started. But year two, sales didn't really grow dramatically, and management was getting worried about what's wrong. The uh, conventional wisdom was, oh, we are charging too much for our product because Indians like a lower price, so let's uh, figure out how to, how to make a product at the lower price. But upper management wasn't happy about re reducing margins, so they hired us to lay, take a look at this. And the result of our study was that uh, we were surprised to find that the consumer was perfectly happy to pay the price that they were charging. They were also happy with the advertising and promotion strategy of the, of the company. There were some issues around getting the product into the retail channel, but this wasn't really the reason for the limited sales because the uh, management had factored that in into making the projections. The core issue we really found had to do with the product itself. The people would try it, but there, there was one aspect of the product that they did not like. And as a result, it was a very limited number of consumers that would make a repeat purchase uh, or make a habit of using this product every time they came to the store. So we ran a focus group study in India to analyze this very carefully. And our conclusion was the product consisted of multiple ingredients. I can, and I'm prohibited by the NDA to say exactly what the product was. But essentially, there was one component of the product that was very attractive to a Canadian and American audience, but which the Indian audience didn't really care about. So our recommendation at the end to the client was very simple, to remove this one ingredient from the product. Removing that ingredient without changing anything else actually reduced the cost to the client of the product by 6%. They were able to maintain the price. And at the same time, their volumes went back up in, in year three to much closer to their original projections. And by now, the volumes are actually exceeding their original projections. So they're still behind the original plan, but they have caught up. They made up for the gap, and they see uh, you know, a much brighter path for this product line plus other product lines that they're going to introduce in India now that they have the confidence. And so the success really happened from being able to adjust the product to meet the needs of the Indian consumer. I'll give you another example, which is not from our client, so I can talk freely about it. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Tupperware, and uh, Tupperware has been in India for a while, but they struggled at first because they were selling essentially American products in India, and refrigerators in India are different, eating habits are different. Today, two of their top sellers are pictured here. One is a plastic spice box, as you know, as you might know, Indians like to use a lot of spices in their cooking. And in the past, they used either metal or wooden containers for their spices that sit right by the stove. The plastic containers are far superior to those, and those have worked out very well. And then they offer uh, this uh, lunch carrier, uh, which is partitioned in a very specific way, where the Indian bread can sit in one compartment, and the vegetables and gravy can sit in another compartment. This, this configuration works far better than the lunch boxes that they had tried to sell before. And this, these are used not only by students, but also by, uh, by office workers who prefer to take home-cooked uh, food with them to the office rather than buy something uh, at, the, uh, you know, at, uh, at uh, the place of work or at a restaurant. So both of these have been grand successes for Tupperware. So the takeaway for product is that you want to make your product India ready. You're going to be selling to many diverse segments in India, and you, you, want, you want to adapt your product uh, to the Indian market. On the bottom right, I have a picture of, uh, of uh, Frito-Lay's most successful snack in India. They do sell the, uh, you know, the, the Lay's chips and uh, Cheetos and so on, 
but they are very small in market share compared to a brand that they introduced just in India. It's called Kurkure, which means like crispy, spicy snacks. And Kurkure uh, are offered in dozens of different SKUs with very different uh, configurations and flavors. And they have really become the dominant snack food in India. You will see them being sold uh, pretty much across the country in retail channels, in, in uh, convenience stores, in push carts. And uh, they've been tremendously successful, but uh, they don't taste anything like the product, like any Frito-Lay product you would buy in the United States. Uh, the, it's, not, it's not unusual that some products can be sold in India ahead of the West. This happened with, uh, with wireless, uh, uh, in, in, with, with uh, fiber optic uh, uh, internet uh, offered to the home. This ha happened with ATM cards that are biometrically sensitive rather than have a mag stripe because a lot of the Indian population is illiterate and introducing a card that doesn't require a pin uh, was actually very, very productive uh, for uh, the banks that did it, including Citibank and including some Indian banks that bought American, uh, American smart uh, biometric cards that essentially rely either on fingerprint recognition or retina recognition, and they're working very, very well uh, in the Indian market. Let's move on to advertising, uh, one of, the, one of the, uh, the, the second P that I want to talk about. And here's a picture of a product made by an Indian company that appeals to middle class and sometimes to aspiring lower middle class uh, audiences. And you will see the unusual factor about this ad is that they're using English on the product and in the middle of the ad, but they also mix in a fair amount of the Hindi script. You'll see that at the very top in the yellow, yellow and green, and then at the bottom where the word glow is in English, but the words around it are in Hindi, and it says, Aisa glow, soch me dal de jo, which translates to your face will glow in a manner that people will, 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 be, will be intrigued or puzzled about it, uh, and that will be a you know, good result of the product that you use. Now, many people think of India as a conservative country uh, where, where mores and values are, are perhaps uh, you know, from Victorian times. And you might be surprised to see an ad like this in a in mainstream Indian print magazine. This is an ad for Kohinoor condoms uh, talking about how their condoms will triple her pleasure. And it's got this, uh, you know, two mirrors and it's showing, you know, the front, the back, and the side. Uh, I was actually censored when I made a presentation at, uh, at an American company. They didn't want me to show this ad because they thought it was too risque for an American audience in, in, in a corporate environment. But the reason I like to pick on this particular ad is to show you that some things that might be contro controversial in America are not controversial at all in India. This wasn't an ad in, a, you know, in, 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 in the Indian equivalent of Playboy or in a you know, um, uh, women's magazine. This really appeared in, in, in a regular you know, corporate kind of, you know, I think it was in Business World magazine. Uh, which is uh, sold by the millions of copies all across the country. And so when you look at advertising in India, uh, you want to tailor it very, very specifically to Indian needs. India today has world-class ad agencies, and uh, uh, you will see that they are able to produce ads that are very relevant to Indian customs, Indian mores, and appeal to things that... Uh, that Indians will care about. Politics, for example, is not considered taboo at all. And today, with the US elections going on, you, won't be, you wouldn't be surprised if you saw ads in India that, that might show a picture of Mitt Romney or, or President Obama and uh, try to make a point about the company's products. It's something that you rarely would see in the United States, but is not considered uh, odd or unusual in a country like India. Let's move on to the third of the P's, uh, which is uh, place or distribution. And again, I want to go back to our client, Paramount Farms, and show you uh, some examples of how their product is shown in the retail stores. The bottom right is a display inside of, uh, uh, of a chain store or a retail a supermarket in India. I believe this might be from uh, the, the big bazaar chain. 
and you will see that uh, you know there are uh, the traditional aisles in the back, but uh, Paramount has set up a special display looking very similar to what you might see at uh, at a Ralphs or a, or a Vons here in the United States. And uh, this this is how they display the product at uh, at a major store. But now I want you to pay attention to the picture on the left. This is a more traditional retail store in India. Uh, these are typically very small, anywhere from uh, just a little kiosk to about three or four hundred square feet. In this particular case, this is a store that specializes in what they call dry fruits in India. So they are selling uh, they are selling some candy and they are selling. Uh, uh, almonds and pistachio nuts and, and other uh, other types of uh, of, uh, of uh, nuts and, and 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 raisins and so on, and you'll see that the Paramount product is, is displayed on the uh, back counter there uh, in a prominent location. But the store looks, you know, in in many cases, in in many ways, probably primitive by Indian standards. Typically, this is run by an owner operator. The guy in the picture is either the owner or the owner's son. Uh, the store is. Uh, you know, it's very small, and you might, as a casual visitor to the, you know, to India, you might dismiss this channel. But I want to tell you that 90% of Paramount sales are through stores like this. While the nice big displays on the right are great to kind of build awareness, they account for less than one dollar out of every ten that Paramount sells in India. Even though they are a more modern company than many others, 90% of the sales happen at small single location stores and uh, the supply chain that feeds into them therefore becomes crucial. So today if you're going to sell consumer products into India, you almost cannot ignore the uh, traditional retail as it is called in India. So if you look at distribution as you travel to India is as I hope some of you will when you when you start to sell your products, you will see this uh, this uh, Eclectic collection of, of vehicles and transport mechanisms. The picture on the upper left is actually uh, from the CIA website, believe it or not. It's an overloaded hay truck. On the right side, you see a picture of a scooter that is modified uh, because the, they removed the rear seat and installed a, a food carrier so they can deliver uh, hot lunches or meals to order. Uh, the picture in the middle on the top is, an, is, is a cycle rickshaw, and this is in a big city. I think this was taken in the city of Chennai, and they deliver eggs on this rickshaw tricycle. Now at the bottom you might say, ah, I see something familiar now. I see a Pepsi truck. That I recognize. That could even happen in the United States. But that's not what I want to show you in that picture. Look to the left of that Pepsi truck. You will see, a again, a tricycle that is delivering Product and this picture is from New Delhi. Okay. The point that I want to make here is that your product from your factory in the United States, or if you put up a factory in the region, from the time it leaves the factory to the point it actually gets into the consumer's hand, will go through many modes of transportation. Some may be a little more brutal than you are used to. Uh, some may subject your product to heat, dust, and humidity in a manner that uh, your uh, company may not have anticipated or may not have designed for. Uh, you still want your product to finally make it to the consumer in a form that looks reasonable and acceptable to the consumer. So we spend a good deal of time with our clients in helping plan that process. So here's an example of a company that has been very successful in India. Pepsi offers direct distribution into every town in India that has a population of over 5,000. You will see on the left, uh, this is a small roadside uh, stall, uh, and the picture is, uh, is again an American visitor. You can see on the left, uh, but it's it's a small store that sells cold drinks and maybe some hot tea and uh, and perhaps some snacks. Uh, on the Right side, you see a picture with both Pepsi and Coke represented, and the strips of product that you see hanging above the Pepsi cooler uh, would be could be some of those kurkure snacks that I showed on earlier slides. There's also some uh, some cigarette products and and other things selling there, and you see that uh, uh, the the guy sitting there um, in front of the store uh, drinking the Pepsi. 
you know, might be a customer or he might even be, you know, uh, one of the owners of the neighboring shops. Coke announced just a few weeks ago that they are so happy with their success in India that they are going to invest another $5 billion to expand their presence. They, they think that India will become one of Coca-Cola's largest markets over the next decade. And, and, and so there's tremendous forward movement happening among companies of all sizes. I realize many of you on the phone don't have the kind of budget that Coke and Pepsi do, but I just want to use these examples because these are people, these are brands that everybody understands. Many of our clients have sales that are, you know, in the 10 to 20 to $50 million range or higher, and they're also finding equal success as they enter and expand in the Indian market. So when you look at place or distribution in India, what you have to be conscious of is that it's a multi-layer system. You don't have the efficient logistics that you are used to in the United States. Many of the large CPG companies in India will have thousands of distributors. Then they have people called agents and sub-agents and stocking distributors and non-stocking distributors. It's a fairly complex system that eventually delivers product to over 6 million outlets across the country. My mother lives in the northern Indian city of Kanpur in India, and she, when she needs groceries, she actually doesn't even have to stir out of the house. She picks up her cell phone, and that's very common because people have stopped using landlines in a, in a large way in India. Uh, she picks up her cell phone and calls the nearby store and tells them what she wants, and 10 minutes later, a, a, a a, a young man shows up at her door with all of her groceries uh, selected and picked up, and, and she pays him there, and she's done. Now, my mom like, likes to pay cash, and so, uh, so she pays right there, but many, many other consumers in India will use this home delivery service because the store will also extend them credit. If you're in the lower middle class or you're, you, you work in a job where you live from paycheck to paycheck, these local neighborhood stores understand the needs of their consumers and they will offer or extend credit to, their, to the consumers in the neighborhood because they know where they live, they know exactly what's going on, they have the buzz, and so they use that as the, as the credit rating rather than a TDA, TRW, or an Experian rating. So there, there's uh, factors that are very specific to India that, uh, that enable the success of uh, both foreign and domestic companies in India that, that you need to be conscious of as you enter the market there. Let's now talk about the fourth P uh, of marketing, uh, pricing. And here I want to start with an example from the most powerful consumer company in the U.S., Procter & Gamble. They are uh, relatively smaller in India, and they operate in baby care, trying to compete a little bit with Johnson & Johnson. They have a hair care line with uh, Pantene and other shampoos. But the example I want to talk to you about is, is fabric care. Now, I was in India in December 2008, and Bob McDonald, who at that time was the chief operating officer of Procter & Gamble, had just arrived in India. I was there at a conference where I was speaking. The keynote earlier in the day was Bob, and he had arrived in India for the first time ever just a day ago, and you could tell that he was really dazzled by the country and the opportunity there. He spoke about, about what his... Uh, team had researched in India and how they looked at the opportunity in India. The following year, he was promoted to become the CEO, and he now wants India to be one of the top markets for the company. What they have found is that as they have reconfigured the product and have offered, in this case I'm talking about Pantene and Head & Shoulders, rather than offering that in the uh, familiar bottles that you might buy here in California. They went with the approach that's very popular in India where you sell the product in a single-use sachet, as they call it. So it's a small plastic uh, uh, container, almost looks like a you know, Heinz ketchup uh, container, you know, a pouch that you might get at a McDonald's when you, when you buy some fries. That sells retail for six cents. Some of, the, some of the sachets may go for $0.05, cents, some may go for as much as $0.10. Cents. But in India today, over 60% of the volume of all shampoos sold 
is sold in the form of these single-use sachets because that's what the consumer finds convenient. They buy only what they need, and they use it as they need it. The packaging is, of course, a little less efficient, but this is what works for the Indian consumer. And so they had to make that leap to be able to go to the method that works in India. They found a similar experience with Ariel and Tide, their detergent brands. A few years ago, when they reduced their price, their volumes, and their profit shot up dramatically. So many of these products need to be configured to the Indian mindset and to the Indian wallet. This doesn't mean that you have to compromise on gross profits. It does mean that you have to configure the product and you have to take cost out of it in some cases to be able to address the, the way that the Indian consumer wants to buy. Uh, for those of you who are interested in premium or luxury products, I have a little case study on L'Oreal. Which, which, which is a French company that, that, that is very successful in India selling a premium product. And I'll be happy to send that out to anybody who emails me with a request. So here, here's uh, some more examples or some more data about pricing. You will see here on the top right an example of a shampoo sold by an Indian company. And so the imagery the colors and the language of the, is shown in the ad is not English. At the bottom right is, is a more premium product that is sold uh, you know, to, to a uh, more upscale audience, again addressing hair care, but that is, uh, you know, that, that is priced higher. And you'll see that the women are dressed differently as well. The woman in the top is wearing a you know, typical uh, Indian clothing, and the colors are very much those that, that would appeal to middle class Indians. Whereas the purple and you know the T-shirts and and so on in the bottom picture are definitely appealing to the upscale or the the aspirational college goer in India, for example. So there is a stratified market in India. I think that's very important to keep in mind. Uh, one great example of that is Unilever. When they sell detergent, they've got three different products. Surf, the product that they, they that they used to sell in the U.S., I, I, I guess they still might, uh, and, and certainly are very successful in the rest of the world, is that mainstream or premium product. They have a, another product price somewhat lower called RIN, which I don't believe was ever sold in the U.S., but is sold in some emerging countries. And then in response to domestic competition from companies in India, such as Nirma, they, reduced, they introduced a product called Wheel, which is priced at one-fourth of what they charge for surf. And today, that makes up almost half of their volume. This was a product that doesn't exist in Unilever's portfolio anywhere else. They introduced it specifically for the Indian market. And today, it's responsible for a, for a very substantial portion of their profits and, 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 and does extremely well for, for them. So it's not unusual to have this kind of market segmentation. It's not always based on price. Sometimes it's based on consumer preference. Sometimes it's based on geography. We help our clients analyze exactly what are the parameters that the, that the consumer will respond to given the competitive landscape and given the strengths of the particular company that is entering or expanding in the Indian marketplace. So uh, let me switch very briefly to the challenges, and I'll be happy to take questions. So when you look at India, you want to look very carefully because it's, it's easy to get confused and jump to conclusions that are inappropriate. So very few people are successful in India unless they take detailed guidance from somebody who understands the country. And it's not an issue about language. It's really an issue about culture and sensibilities. Uh, many Indians that you meet will speak English when you travel there but they will speak English differently, and they will definitely think differently. So you definitely want to have some guidance. The second thing, again, related to that, as I mentioned earlier, is, is this illusion of cultural understanding. And finally, keep in mind that as an American, you may enter many other markets as the lead dog, but in India, you will be behind the European and British companies and sometimes the Chinese, Korean, and Japanese companies. 
people in India love the United States, but you really have to pay your dues, and you have to you have to start from uh, the attitude that you have to function with humility. Once you do that, Indians are very responsive to new products, new ideas, and to Americans in particular. So what I'd like to do now is open up for questions. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the Indian market is huge. And uh, the principles of consumer marketing hold. You can be successful if you get some expert guidance. Uh, Liz, can we go on to the questions? Yes, absolutely. I've um, removed everyone's mute button, so feel free to um, jump in and ask a question. If you don't feel comfortable um, just chiming in, feel free to use that chat function at the bottom right hand of your screen as well, and I can address the questions to our speaker. Um, I have I have a couple questions if someone's still, still thinking about theirs. Um, so you mentioned that um, there's a lot of things to consider in the India market, but some things may not be as taboo as we may assume that they are in India. But are there any are there any issues that Indian consumers just don't like seeing expressed when you're advertising there? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think. Broadly speaking, for the country as a whole, no. Uh, the, there is an audience who will respond to, to uh, basically any kind of advertising uh, or, or imagery. But there, the market is very highly segmented. So if you're appealing to young college-going students in the city of Mumbai, they will behave very differently from if you happen to be Western Union and you are selling money transfer services to rural India, they, they, their sensibilities will be very different. So I think the important thing is not to look at India as a unified market, but to look at your specific segment. And there you will find very particular sensibilities. Uh, the, the, the one thing that I think I would apply generally is around religious sensibilities. India is a, is a very diverse country, much like the United States, but they react to religious symbols in advertising perhaps not not very well and particularly from a foreign company you know because they the li likelihood of misinterpreting something that is a traditional religious symbol uh, you know an indian company may use it and it's, it's it's okay because they understand the nuances but if a western company uses it uses it whether it's right or not, somebody or the other will object and try to make a, deal, a big deal out of it. So that's one thing I would definitely avoid. But other than that, I wouldn't have any general taboos. There will be specific taboos depending on the segment you're addressing. Does that answer your question, Liz? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Does it, um, are there any other questions out there? I know, we, I know we covered a lot of topics, so it might be hard to remember everything. But, um, but feel free to jump in at any time. Well, let me address one point that often comes up in webinars like this, and people ask, you know, what is what is my biggest risk in going to India? You know, it's far away, and I want to be sure that I tell my owners or my management or my peers, you know, what the risks are. And, you know, I alluded to this in passing, but I want to make a specific point of it. I think the biggest risk is really lack of preparation. People look at India and they say, well, you know, my doctor happens to be of Indian origin or there's an employee of my company who's, who's Indian. So I talk to them and I understand what India is all about and I feel well prepared and I can go and, you know, sign a deal or make, you know, make some business happen. And usually that's a very dangerous thing. Nine times out of ten. Uh, India has changed quite a bit since your, you know, your Indian employees left the country or since your, you know, your, your local contacts of Indian origin uh, uh, started living here. You want to spend the time with somebody who's an expert in your field and an expert in India to be able to give you that, that guidance. Uh, that preparation is crucial. You can't get it by just, uh, uh, you know, by, by, by any kind of casual effort. You do need to spend that time up front, and it will pay you tremendous rewards in the long run. Um, Have the questions come in through the 
Yes, Stephen types in a question. Um, he would like to know, what do you think is the appeal of American products in India? That's an excellent question. So the, to many Indians, the appeal is really, you know, America, the American lifestyle and American values are what many Indians aspire to. So first of all, as, as backdrop, India is a democracy. India has a free press. India does not censor Google, does not prevent the number of you know, movies coming into, into India from the West. So they are very much aware of Western culture. They see America as, as, as a vibrant country. They, their interactions with Americans, whether it is through watching soap operas or, uh, or movies or whatever, have, ge have generally led them to think that good things happen in America. You see this very visible when you visibly when you visit Mumbai or Bangalore or any of the cities and the new developments and new residential developments in India have names such as Palm Springs or Malibu or you know Bayview Heights or something which are very very much inspired by by by, by names out of California if you will. Uh, my 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 cousin in 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 South India lives in 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 a development called Palm Springs, and uh, and and so there's the appeal of Western values and the Western culture is very high in India. The other factor that's important, I think, is that they recognize that American products stand for quality. You know, that you will get something good. You know, it may be a little premium priced, but it, you know, it, it won't harm you, and uh, and it will generally be of higher quality than products from other countries. So I, I'd say those are probably the two key things. Um, one last question coming in from Maryland. Did you want me to read your message? Um, it says, do you have advice for companies that provide business services, uh, for example, project feasibility, um, project implementa implementation, and structure? So do I have advice for companies that provide those kinds of services? Correct. Yes, I think I think it's uh, if you provide those kinds of services, I assume you're talking about providing those services in India for Indian customers. If that is the case, you can absolutely do it. But what you need to do is understand what the Indian competition is like. You want to be able to understand what the lay of the land in India is like, and eventually you want to be able to hire an Indian team to be able to deliver against that. And, and, and I, I'm aware of many companies who have taken those initiatives on. For example, we helped somebody in the architecture business do exactly that. Uh, there are other, other areas where, where there are good markets to offer those types of services, but you do need to have an Indian flair to make it successful. If, on the other hand, the questioner meant that they want to offer services in the United States to American companies entering the Indian market, Clearly, there's room for that as well. We stay very busy doing that. That's much of the work we do, but there's room for more people. There's, uh, the, the demand is clearly much larger than, than a company like Amrit can address. Uh, yes. I have a question. Yes. What are the bureaucratic hurdles? Just in general or in a particular, do you have a specific kind of bureaucratic hurdle you're concerned about? Like um, licenses or uh, permissions? Ah, okay. Okay, good Good question. So in the India of old, you know, India became independent in 1947, and until 1991, India was, uh, was a socialist democracy, if you will. It, it was high, very highly regulated. And all production, all employment was controlled by licenses. And it was referred to uh, pejoratively as the license raj. You know, they said the British raj left. The, we, 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 we became independent of the British, but we didn't become independent of the license raj. In 1991, India was on the verge of bankruptcy, was on a serious economic crisis, and the government, over the course of 17 days, took a dramatic change of path. And they dropped most licensing. They liberalized the economy. They opened it up, uh, the, the stock market for foreign investment and trading in commodities and futures and options. And really, the economy hasn't looked back since. The old way used to be that 
uh, you know, the, 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 the British invented red tape, but the Indians over 50 years perfected it. Uh, today, I am happy to say that much of that, in, that bureaucratic red tape infrastructure has melted away. It's not completely gone, so it's not like things have become as efficient as Singapore or Switzerland, but clearly in many, many areas, you can, you can actually meet senior government officials. They will give you an audience. They will listen to you. In many, many areas, you can file things electronically. Uh, I, in fact, you know, we have a company in India, and I, I can tell you I have digital signature capability in India that uh, you know, the state of California hasn't given me for some of our papers that we file here. Uh, the the uh, company laws in India, business laws in India, are standard across the entire country, whereas here you have to incorporate in a particular state. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a lawyer, you, you are licensed to practice in one state. That's not the case in India. You can practice anywhere in the country. You can... You know, if you're a company based in Mumbai, you, 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 you have the right to hire people anywhere. Uh, you don't have to get separate state-by-state state, uh, incorporations, if you will. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of difference between state laws. Like we have 50 laws here in this country, in, in some cases, when you get into a serious uh, legal entanglement. So the bureaucracy is there, but it is much better than it used to be. Uh, and uh, you still, if you're going to set up a factory in India, you're going to employ Indian labor, Blue-collar workers, there's many things you need to be aware of, but it's, it's much, much better than it used to be. Thank you. Um, if anyone doesn't have any questions, any other questions, I'd really like to take a moment to um, have you sort of explain the services that AMRIT provides. Um, and I, I think it would be a great benefit for people entering the India market. Sure. I'm delighted to do that. And uh, so first of all, I would say that anyone who would like a copy of the presentation or anyone who was too shy to ask a question on, uh, you know, on the live webinar, please uh, take a look at the screen. You can email us at usa at amrit.com. That's usa at amrit.com. Mention that you attended the webinar in the subject line. And then tell us a little bit about your company and give us some contact information in case we need to clarify something with you. And then feel free to send us any questions you want. We'll be able to respond to those uh, during the course of the next week. Now, as a consulting firm, we at Amrit believe in that exports from the, in, from the United States to India are going to grow by 400 to 500% over the next five years. And so for many of you in the audience, the opportunity in India is huge, and it can be tapped in many, many different ways. We offer services to help California companies, American companies in general, and, and to some extent Canadian companies as well, to be able to take advantage of the markets in India. We can do an initial assessment of the market. We can help you execute against that assessment. We have a senior team of people on the ground in India who are very familiar with various market segments, so they can help you with uh, defining your product, with configuring it, with finding distributors, with hiring people in India, with uh, recommendations on pricing, with uh, determining your promotional strategy. Um, you know, if you have to put up a factory in India, uh, or you have to do a joint venture, we can help you guide, uh, you know, help guide you on all of those functions. We are not attorneys or accountants, and and so we we. We find you the appropriate lawyers and uh, CPAs or CAs, as they are called in India, to be able to perform those routine functions with an Indian flair. You might want to use some of your U.S. advisors to get you started, but really you want action on the ground in India, and so we are able to put that entire package for you. We work for American companies. We, we are not hired by or paid by anybody in India, so we are always on your side. And we can work, as I mentioned today, we've talked mostly about consumer goods, but our services extend across business products. We work in the areas of defense, medical devices, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, you name it. Any, any, any kind of product or service that can be offered in India, uh, we can help you with that. Uh, so I, with that, I, I would encourage you to, again, send me any questions, and uh, we'll be delighted to talk to people offline. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, 
like I said at the beginning, I don't want to take up anyone's time. I know everyone's time is valuable. Um, so if you do have any other questions for either myself or Mr. Bagla, please feel free to um, email either of us directly. And I did record the session, so it, it will be available if you'd like to have it. Um, and we will be sending out um, a, a PDF copy of the presentation um, later on today for everyone that participated. So um, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I hope everyone learned um, as much as I did. And um, please um, stay in touch with us as we'll have more of these webinars as the year continues. And, and thank you again for, for your time today. We really appreciate it.